Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lab Water Source webinar. I'm your host, Anne Marie Stafford, and today's presentation is Ghost Busting for Your Lab Water System Solving Problems with Cartridge and RO Membrane Life. Today's webinar will have two presenters. Kim Nepper is the Global Application Specialist for Water Purification at Thermo Fisher Scientific. She previously served as technical product support for our water purification solutions. Kim works with teams to develop training programs and perform application testing and analysis. She was recently interviewed on the topic of ultra-pure water for the National Geographic TV show, Going Deep with David Reese. Kim holds a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in biology. Gail Glykoff is the Applications Lab Manager for Thermo Fisher Scientific Water and Laboratory Products. She holds a bachelor's in chemistry and a master's in environmental science. Gail has been with Orion Water Analysis Instruments since 2000, working first in engineering and then as an application chemist. As a registered guest, you will receive a link to this recorded webinar in your email when it becomes available. This webinar, including Q&A, will last about an hour. Type your questions at any time into the text box in the Q&A module that you see on the right side of the screen. Our presenters will answer questions at the end of the webinar. This is an interactive webinar and you will be asked a few survey questions throughout the presentation. We will share the results so you can compare your answers with your peers. This ends our introduction and now I present to you, Kim Nepper. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and greetings everyone. Thanks for joining us today. In today's webinar, we're going to do some ghost busting for lab water purification systems by seeking solutions to common prob problems about ultra-pure deionization cartridges and reverse osmosis membranes. We will cover the three common factors that can shorten ultra-pure deionization cartridge life and how to fix the problem, how to spot the three feed water impurities that can cause your reverse osmosis membranes to fail, and then ghost busting 101, simple tests identify the root cause of water system problems. This will ensure not only your ultra-pure water quality, but it will also save your lab time and money. So let's get started busting those ghost water ghosts. But first, let's start off with a survey question just to find out a little bit more about your lab. Thank you, Kim. Using the survey question module in the center of the screen, please answer the following question. For the ultra-pure water system in your lab, how frequently do you replace the deionization cartridge? And as a quick reminder, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can enter those using the Q&A module in the lower right corner of your screen. I'm going to give this a moment as answers continue to come in. Okay, Kim, it looks like things are starting to slow down, so I'm going to go ahead and broadcast results now. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So it seems like 37% of you will replace the cartridge about every six months, while 20, about 30, it just changed already. So about 33% change the cartridges about every three months, and actually about 33% change the cartridges about every six months. Um, some of you are lucky enough, about 11% of you are lucky enough to change it every 12, and some of you aren't sure. So for those of you that do know uh, when you usually change the cartridges, any ex unexpected changes to this timeline can be very scary for the lab. So by the end of this webinar, you will have the tools to conquer these scary events that can occur. So let's first start with a look at how deionization works. Ultra-pure water systems use cartridges that contain deionization resins that have a specific number of exchange sites. Now these sites attract and exchange positive ions or cations, for example, calcium, magnesium, and sodium, for hydrogen ions. And they also exchange negative ions or anions, for example, chlorides and carbonates, for hydroxyl ions. Then this process is an excellent way to remove ions from the water. When the deionization cartridges are new, there are many functional exchange sites, and the ultra-pure water system can reach up to 18.2 megohm or 0.055 mic microsiemens per centimeter. Therefore, to create type 1 water, these deionization cartridges in the ultra-pure water system do the work to purify ionic impurities down to trace levels. It's also important to step back 
and look at the feed water to the type 1 and even type 2 deionization systems. So some ultra-pure water systems can handle tap water, which has the highest amount of impurities, such as ions, organic, part particulates, and bacteria. Now, ionized solids do make up a majority of the impurities in the water. Tap water ionized solids can range from 30 to 500 part per million, while pretreated water supplies can fall in the part per billion range. Ultra-pure water systems that are fed directly with tap water would typically have the shorter life of deionization cartridges because they have to work harder to remove the high levels of impurities, unless, of course, they have some type of pretreatment. Now, pretreatment could include reverse osmosis, distillation, or deionization, or a combination of these technologies. This removes the majority of the feed water impurities so the type 1 system can focus on polishing out the remaining impurities to achieve high quality of water for a longer period of time. Now, labs are haunted by this question. Why did my ultra-pure water system DI cartridges not last as long as they had in the past? Now, there are several ghostly factors that could influence DI cartridge life. Quantity of water processed through the system, the quality of the feed water involving levels of ions and or organics, and then number three, the mechanical issues with the water system. So why do we call them ghostly? Well, they can exist but not be seen. They can sometimes appear to pop up out of nowhere, and they may disappear and reappear without advanced warning. So let's investigate more in-depthly these ghostly factors and how they can affect the lab water system and what can be done to bust them. Now the first ghost that can haunt the ultra-pure water system cartridge life is the quantity of water run through the system. The more water that's run through the system, the more ions in contact with the deionization resins that will exhaust the cartridges. So let's compare what can happen when the quantity of water used by the lab changes. And in this case, we're looking at a type 2 water system that only uses two deionization cartridges. So looking at the purple bars in the graph, we have a lab that has 20 microsemen RO water. Now if the lab uses five liters a day, or even 20 liters a day, they would be able to get at least a year of use from the ultra-pure water system cartridges. However, if the lab usage would increase to, the, to 100 liters a day, their cartridge life would reduce to about 85 days of, of use. Now let's contrast that to a lab with the green bars that have 500 microsemen tap water, or about 250 part per million of total ionized solids. The cartridge life is shortened to 60 days if they have a light use of 5 liters per day. And if the lab uses 20 liters per day, they'll get 15 days of use. And if they have heavy usage of water of 100 liters a day, they'll only get about 3 days of use of, of the cartridges. Now note, these estimates will vary by the water system and by the feed water. Now how to assess, this? is this a really a ghost we're dealing with? It's good to investigate with the following questions. Is this expected cartridge life based on the usage and the water supply? Was more water used from the water system than normal? Are there new processes, procedures, or even people that have been added to the lab? Are people washing large amounts of water through the system. So what if the water system is going through water cartridges quickly because of the quantity that's being used? Well, the lab may need to look and consider, do they need to add any additional pretreatment? Or we may need to check to see if the water system is really sized appropriately. Sometimes we find that labs, labs will get smaller systems because of the price but realize as the needs for the water has grown, a larger system may be, may be necessary. The second ghost, and often the most scary one of all, is feed water quality. Now, organics in the feed water can shorten the life of the ultra-pure water system cartridges as they're attracted to the carbon resins, but additionally, some total organic carbon can weakly attach to the anion resins and interfere with the deionization process. A total organic carbon, or TOC, 
can fluctuate in the feed water supply depending on the source. So for instance, in a tap water supply that's from an open body of water or a reservoir, they could have seasonal changes. Pre-treated sources of water, for example, service DI systems, can have TOCs that are colloidal, and these can come off of the regenerated DI resins. Now these are not monitored in the feed water, and therefore are not often detected. So what is the recommended TOC level for feed water for a lab water system? Well, it depends on the system. TAP, the type 1 systems, could require TOCs to be in the typical tap water range of about 1 to 5 part per million. Now in contrast, the thermoscientific Barnstead GenPure type 1 polishing system that are, it's required to be fed with a pre-treated water supply of about a TOC level of less than 50 part per billion. If the organic levels are elevated, it could be a sign of organic contamination and further pretreatment may be necessary. Pretreatment could be as simple as adding a carbon or a macro reticular resin to, or a cartridge to trap the organics, or it might be something more elaborate like a reverse osmosis system. The most common, the most common ghost for DI water systems are ions in the feed water. Now this can be expressed as total ionized solids and can easily be measured by the conductivity of the water. The more ionic impurities in the water, the faster the deionization exchange sites will be used up. So when we look at this example of cartridge life versus feed water quality, this chart compares the volume of water the ultra pure water system can produce based on different qualities of feed water. So as we can see, the service DI or distilled water are excellent sources of pretreated water with a purity of about one megohm or one microsiemen per centimeter. And it could, be easy, it could be considered ASTM type two water. Now ultra pure water system cartridges will tend to have the longest life on this feed water. Reverse osmosis feed water will depend on the tap water quality, but generally allow the water system to produce, process a large amount of water as well. Note, while service DI, distilled, and RO are ideal to have as a pretreatment, water is fluid, dynamic, and the quality can change quickly. So if these pretreatment systems are nearing the end of its service life, or even during regular maintenance, a large amount of ions could come through the system and could affect any water system that it is feeding. Now you'll also notice the leaders processed through the ultra pure water system drops off considerably with tap water and poor, uh, average or poor tap water. Even a short term spike of impurities can come through the water line and unless testing or monitoring the water was done at that moment, it would be an unrecorded event However, its impact would exhaust the lab water system's cartridges quickly. Now this strange activity is not necessarily uncommon. So here is a customer example of a scary impact that a service DI failure can have on a type one ultra pure water system. So in this real case, the thermal scientific Barnstead micro pure water system is required to be fed with a pre-treated water. So if the water supply is about one megohm or one microsiemen, the system can easily produce 5,000 liters or even up to one year of use until the micropure cartridges are exhausted. The lab noticed the ultra-pure water system purity dropped rapidly. And at the same time, the water system had an alert that the feed water quality was low. A quick check of the feed water found that it was nothing more than tap water going into it. It appeared that the service DI feed water system was either exhausted or in desperate need of repair. This all happened quickly, and luckily the lab busted this ghost as they were able to alert other labs to the problem because they were monitoring the ultra pure water system display on a regular basis. Now, reverse osmosis or, or RO systems are often used as a pretreatment or even as a standalone purification. And these can typically remove up to 98 to 99% of the ions, organics, particles, and bacteria from the water. Now 98% sounds like a lot of removal, 
But if the feed water has a very high salt or mineral content, then the product water may not be as high a quality as compared to a water supply with fewer ions. Tap water is not the same from city to city and from well to well. So this chart compares different qualities of tap water and what kind of quality we would expect from an RO membrane. So for example, if you're fortunate enough to have a good tap water supply of about 50 part per million of total ionized solids, 98% would mean that the RO water being produced could have a purity of around one part per million of ionized solids which is about two microsiemens of purity. Now, we tend to find the average tap water quality to be around 150 part per million, million. So the RO purification would be about three part per million with the new membrane. And of course, there are some areas that are not that lucky. Some water supplies have 500 ppm of total ionized solids or even higher. And that would result in a product water of about 10 part per million or 20 microsiemens. Therefore, when labs ask what is the purity of RO water, we really cannot exactly say as it depends on that feed water quality and the performance of the membrane. Now, when the RO membrane starts to age, whether it's naturally from use or prematurely because of improper pretreatment, the system may not be as efficient as at the rejection of the salts and minerals in the water and that percent rejection will start to lower from 98% to 80 to 70. So what is the effect on the quality, and what does this mean for the ultra-pure water systems that are being fed with this RO system? So over time, as the membrane's percent rejection drops, more ions can come through the system and exhaust the DI cartridges, in addition to potentially higher levels of those other impurities such as organics and bacteria. So at 70% rejection, a good tap water could allow up to 15 parts per million of ions through for the product water. Average tap water could be up to 50 parts per million, and poor tap water could be up to 75 parts per million. Note, while the RO water quality is markedly better than the tap water, the additional ions in the water may not be ideal. The third DI system ghost are mechanical issues in the ultra-pure water system. For example, leaks of any kind in the ultra-pure water system need to be repaired quickly or they can use up the, the cartridge life. There are potentially other mechanical ghosts as well. Deionization resins depend on a consistent flow rate and the pressure of the water through the cartridges for a good contact time with the resins. So if there's no recirculation of the water, the purity will drop and it will appear that ghosts have gotten a hold of the cartridges. Therefore, a common feature in ultra-pure water systems are pressure-reducing valves, one-way check valves, and recirculation pumps. So in these cases, always check with the manufacturer's technical service for further troubleshooting. When troubleshooting the ultra-pure water system cartridge life, it is a process of elimination to identify that ghostly root cause. So first, check the quantity of the water. Verify that the volume of water being used in, in include the water used for applications such as rinsing glassware. Determine if there's any new protocols or, that require water or even additional staff that can use water. All of this will have an impact on the light, cartridge life. Check for any changes in the feed water quality. And if it is a central supply of water, check to see if this, how the stat system is performing or if there is any maintenance done. And then lastly, for any mechanical issues with the system, technical service may need to be contacted for further troubleshooting. Now, helpful information to include about the system are details such as model number, serial number, cartridges and their lot numbers, when were they last replaced, what is the feed water source? Now note the any changes in purity. For instance, does it fluctuate dramatically during or after dispensing, and by how much? Include any alerts or messages that are on the display. And screenshots and pictures help tell the story and are very helpful. 
details as to the nature of the problem can avoid costly service calls because sometimes the fix is, is quite simple. So let's go ahead and stop for another survey question to find out more about uh, what you know about RO membranes. Thanks, Kim. Using the survey question module in the center of the screen, please answer the following question. Last time my RO membrane was replaced, the membrane didn't last very long. What could be the cause? And just as a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to enter those into the Q&A module in the lower right corner of your screen. I'm going to give it another minute as answers continue to come in. All right, Kim, they're starting to slow up, so I'm going to go ahead and broadcast the results. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So I see uh, some of you do believe it's the hardness and the particulates, um, and 18% uh, of you do think it's chlorine, but mo the majority of you do think it's uh, the all of the above, and that's right. It is all of the above that can affect um, the, the RO membrane. So let's next look at what's feeding ultra-pure water systems, which is typically an RO system. So why did my RO membranes not last as long as they had in the past? RO, reverse osmosis systems or even type 2 systems that use RO technology in them are common ways to purify water for laboratories. And there are three ghostly feed water contaminants that can affect their life, which are particulates, hardness, and chlorine. Understanding these three factors that can affect an RO membrane can help you properly maintain the water system to ensure the long life of the RO membrane. And since changes can happen gradually, it's best to monitor the RO system's performance over time to detect clues as to when the RO membrane is approaching the end of its usable life. But first, how does reverse osmosis work? Reverse osmosis is best explained by first considering the process of osmosis. In a typical example, a semi-permeable membrane is used to separate two solutions, one saline solution and one pure water solution. And each solution is going to be open to the atmosphere. In osmosis, the pure water will flow through the membrane to dilute the saline solution in an attempt to equalize the salt concentrations. But when pressure is applied to the saline solution side of the membrane, the natural process of osmosis is reversed. Water from the saline solution passes through the membrane, leaving the saline solution more concentrated. This is reverse osmosis. Now, reverse osmosis is used as a pretreatment before an ultra-pure deionization system. And reverse osmosis is a great way to remove a majority of the general impurities in the water. But as we discussed earlier, it is a percent rejection technology, so the purity will depend on the feed water quality and the integrity of the membrane. Now, if RO is a percent rejection technology, what is the best way to measure the quality to know how it's performing? So the best way to monitor the RO system is by measuring the conductivity of the product water, or often referred to as the permeate. The higher the quality, the more ions permeating through the RO membrane, and the lower the RO quality. But it's also good to compare that product water to the actual feed water. And over time, as the membrane ages, the percent rejection of ions will change. RO membranes may need to be replaced when that percent rejection has fallen below a certain percent or a certain permeate quality. So we're going to take a second to kind of quiz all of you to see if you can identify a common feed water contaminant. Thanks, Kim. All right, folks. Using the survey module found in the center of your screen, please answer the following question. Identify the common tap water contaminant shown in this tubing at the right. So we've got a lot of answers coming in right now. We'll give it just another second. 
All right, Kim, I'm going to go ahead and broadcast results and turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Anne-Marie. So I see um, a majority of you believe this is silt, and 18% uh, believe it's copper, and 27% uh, believe it's rust, and 9% believe it's dilithium crystals. Um, so actually, uh, this is rust that has precipitated out of the water onto the lines. Um, copper would actually be a nice blue-green color, um, but in this case, it is rust. So let's talk about that. The first ghost in the water that can destroy RO membranes are particulates. These can plug the tiny pores of the membrane material, clog the internal water channels, or possibly tear holes in the membrane. Particulates in the water, such as rust, sand, and plumbing debris, may be visible in the water, but often particulates are submicrons, such as algae and silt, and they're not visible to the naked eye, yet they can have that same effect. Particulates can be measured in the water by turbidity or even silt density index, known, also known as SDI. Now, pre-filters are used to protect the RO membranes from particulates in the feed water. Pre-filters are often commonly around 1 to 5 micron in size. So what is the level of concern? If the water is above 1 NTU of turbidity, additional pre-filters are often recommended. So sometimes a cascade of sizes is necessary to remove the par particles in the water. Turbidity can fluctuate throughout the day, which explains why you might see rusty water coming out of a faucet in the morning after the pipes have rust rusted and the particulates have settled out. Replace pre-filters based on time or when there's a reduced flow or water pressure. Now, silt density index, or SDI, is another way to measure particles in the, in the feed water. Silt density index measures the potential for the feed water to foul the membrane. So for RO systems, the level of concern is typically a maximum of 3 SDI, with maybe up to 5 SDI if you do have pre-filters before the RO membrane. To test the SDI, the test is defined in the ASTM standard D4189, and it must be done at the feed water source in the lab using a special test kit to measure a fixed volume of water that's passed through a standard 0.45 micron pore size membrane. Now, local water municipalities may also have the SDI for the area as well if you have municipal tap water. The second ghost in water for RO membranes is hardness. Now, hard water minerals, such as calcium and magnesium, can create deposits on the membrane and over time reduce the permeate or the product water flow rate and increase the conductivity of the RO water. Now, some areas are very lucky and have naturally soft water of less than 60 milligrams per liter of calcium carbonate in the tap water. But most areas do have some level of hardness, whether it be from moderately hard water to very hard water. Now, water hardness is a simple test using a colorimeter. And basically, if the water is not soft, pretreatment of the feed water is necessary using hardness stabilizing or water softening. Now, what does Langley or Saturation Index, or LSI, measure? LSI is a measurement of the saturation of calcium carbonate in the water. And it's measured by calculating the different factors such as pH, total ionized solids, alkalinity, calcium, and the temperature of the water sample. A positive LSI of 1 or greater means the water is saturated with calcium carbonate and some softening or hardness stabilizing is necessary. So again, what should be used if the water is hard? So some type of pretreatment for hard water, again, would involve hardness stabilizing or water softening. Now, hardness stabilizers use a phosphate complex to bind with the calcium and magnesium in the water to prevent it from precipitating onto the membrane. Hardness stabilizers can often be smaller cartridges that can be replaced as the hardness stabilizing crystals inside dissolve. So these are great for small RO systems. 
Now, water softeners are actually an ion exchange of sodium ions for those hardness formers of calcium and magnesium. This does require salt or brine chips in a holding reservoir to allow the water softener to regenerate that, the ion exchange resins as they get exhausted. Now, if the water system does combine RO with EDI technology, a water softener may be recommended as any amount of hard water coming through the RO membrane can harm the EDI cell. If the RO system is a large capacity, then using a water softener may also be more effective as well. The third ghost of RO water systems is chlorine. Now, some RO membranes, such as cellulose acetate membranes, do require a certain amount of chlorine. But more commonly used are thin film composite RO membranes, which have a limited tolerance to free chlorine of less than 0.1 part per million. A prolonged exposure will destroy the surface of the membrane. So what is the symptom if the membrane is exposed to chlorine over a period of time? Increased conductivity. So if the RO system is feeding an ultra-pure water system, another symptom may be short DI cartridge life. Now, carbon cartridges are one of the easiest ways to remove chlorine from the tap water. Carbon cartridges are often changed based on the running time of the water system. And it's estimated based on the feed water chlorine level and the volume of the water the system produces. So another option would be to monitor the water for chlorine breakthrough from the carbon cartridges. But it really is best to replace the carbon before it's exhausted. And then surprise, yep, there is a potential for one more ghost to pop up. The fourth RO system ghosts are mechanical issues. Water pressure and temperature can affect the performance of the RO membrane, rendering it less effective at removing feed water impurities, or it can signal a problem with the membrane. Membrane seals and O-rings allow the water to be forced through the membrane, and these could fail, resulting in increased conductivity as well. Further troubleshooting may need to be done with technical support to identify the problem. Now, in general, it's important to monitor the RO system performance to detect changes over time. This would include tracking pretreatment replacement, monitoring the feed water quality, monitoring the product and or concentrate flow rates, noting the water pressure and water temperature. So next, I'm going to turn this over to Gail who will introduce us to simple tests that can be done for Ghost Busting 101. Thanks, Kim. Hello, this is Gail. Now that Kim has told us all about these ghosts that can get in the machine, it's time to pull out our paranormal investigation equipment, put on our ecto goggles, and go ghost hunting. The first ghost we're going to hunt today is the quality of the feed water, specifically the ionic content of the feed water, which I can hunt down by measuring conductivity. The type of system that I have determines the criterion for the conductivity reading that I want to see when I test for ionic content. When looking at a type 1 system, the feed water should be pretreated to less than 2 microsiemens per centimeter conductivity. When looking at an RO system, the feed water quality should be less than 1,200 microsiemens per centimeter. And when looking at a cartridge system, we'll need to use tap water or a treated water of better quality than tap. To measure any feed water, first I'll collect a sample. To do this, I rinse a bottle or beaker three times with the feed water to ensure the collected sample will not be contaminated by the container. Then I fill the container and test for conductivity. To check the feed water conductivity, I want to take the sample right as it enters the water system at the red star location for each of these pictured systems. Taking the sample here ensures that the sample reflects the quality of the water that my water purification is seeing at that moment. There are fluctuations and changes over time that may not be captured, but collecting this sample gives us a valuable snapshot. In the case of a type 1 system, 
like the GenPure Pro pictured on the right. The last time I tested the pretreated feed water in my lab, the conductivity read less than one microsiemen per centimeter, which is less than the two microsiemen per centimeter criterion. So my feed water quality is good, and it shouldn't cause my cartridge to exhaust prematurely. In the case of the ePure Type 1 system pictured on the left, the feed water can be tap water. If so, the chosen cartridges will be different than if the feed water is pre-treated. The life of the cartridges will depend on the quality of the tap water. The longest cartridge life is achieved when the water is pre-treated before feeding into the ePure system. When testing feed water for type 2 systems or RO systems, it's best to collect and measure the feed water after the pretreatment just as it enters the system. The red star indicates the ideal location. We can also measure the tap water before pretreatment if we need to determine how effectively the pretreatment is performing. We'll talk a little more about that later. The last time that I did this test, I found that the water going into my RO system at the Red Star location was 612 microsiemens per centimeter. This is less than the 1,200 microsiemens per centimeter criterion, so that's good. The lower the better, and the longer my RO cartridges will last. If the conductivity level was greater than 1,200 microsiemens per centimeter, we might consider local pretreatment options to reduce the conductivity, such as service deionization, or RO systems that have specifications for higher conductivity feed water. Got ghosts in the RO system? How do we know? I mean, other than noticing a little goblin peeking out from behind our equipment. Well, ionic overload can be hunted down in our RO system too. The trick is to track it down, make it toast, before we get slimed so to speak. As I mentioned previously, we want the feed water to the RO system to have less than 1,200 microsiemens per centimeter conductivity. Secondly, we want the product water or the permeate to have a conductivity that is at least 75% lower than the feed water. In this case, I want to collect two samples, one of the feed water and one of the product water. To collect the samples, I'll need two containers. I rinse each container three times, fill the containers, feed conductivity, and calculate percent removal. Here's an example of where to collect samples for testing an RO system. Collect and measure the conductivity of the feed water supply right after pretreatment as it goes into the RO system, shown at Red Star 1. Compare this to a conductivity reading of the permeate or product water, just as it goes into the storage tank, shown at Red Star 2. The system should be operating at greater than 75% rejection of ions in the water. Ideally, new membranes will be greater than 90% rejection of ions in the water. The last time I tested this in the ops lab, I found that the conductivity of the feed water to my RO system was 612 microsiemens per centimeter, which is good. I found that the product water conductivity was 50 microsiemens per centimeter. That calculates to be 92% removal, which is quite good. So it looks like my RO system is working very well. Let's take a look at how to do this simple calculation for percent removal. Percent removal is calculated as the difference between the feed water and product water conductivity, divided by the feed water conductivity, then multiplied by 100 to get the percent value. In this case, feed water conductivity was 612 microsiemens per centimeter, and product water quality was 50. Running the calculation, the percent removal comes to 92%, which is very good. If our percent removal calculated to greater than, excuse me, less than 75%, we'd want to start troubleshooting to determine what was happening. If the membrane has been installed a while, likely the membrane needs replacement. Hopefully we've been monitoring it on a regular basis and we've seen this removal rate decline slowly. Other things to consider would be checking the flow rates to see if flows need adjusting 
before flushing the membrane. If that doesn't help, the membrane needs replacing. And let's take a quick break for another survey question here. Thank you, Gail. Using the survey question module in the center of your screen, please answer the following question. What kind of equipment do you have in your lab to test water? And here you can select all that apply. And just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, you can enter those using the Q&A module in the lower right corner of your screen. All right, Gail, it looks like things are slowing up, so I'm going to get a couple more coming in. All right, I'm going to go ahead and broadcast. All Turn right. It back over. All right, thanks, Anne-Marie. Thank well, it looks like most people have a conductivity meter and many people have a turbidity meter. Many people also have a colorimeter or spectrophotometer, and some have a TOC analyzer. So it looks like a lot of people are going to be well equipped for this ghost hunting. All right, let's go to the next slide here. Now here's the ghost hunting equipment that I use in the applications lab for conductivity testing of feed water and product water that might be haunted by unwanted ionic goblins. I use a Thermal Scientific Orion conductivity meter, benchtop or portable, conductivity probe, and standards. To test the water, I simply immerse the conductivity electrode into the sample until the sensor opening is completely submerged and wait for a stable reading. Then I'm done. Got chlorine ghosts in your RO system? Keep calm and hunt them down. If there are chlorine ghosts, you want to make sure they get caught in our ghost trap, otherwise known as the carbon filter cartridge. The free chlorine tolerance of the RO membrane is less than 0.1 milligrams per liter. The RO membrane can withstand short-term exposure to free chlorine, which is also known as hypochlorite. However, eventual degradation of the membrane is expected. An RO membrane exposed to one milligram per liter of free chlorine could start degrading in just over a week. In my location, our tap water typically has a low free chlorine content, but the levels vary over time and with the seasons. To protect the RO unit from chlorine and organic compounds, we pretreat with a carbon cartridge. To test for chlorine, I collect samples in small bottles filled to the top to minimize head spice and minimize the loss of chlorine. And I take them to the ops lab and test them immediately because the chlorine levels change quickly with time. Testing immediately gives me the most representative results. To determine if the RO membrane is being protected from free chlorine, collect a sample of the feed water just as it's going into the RO unit at the location of Red Star 1. If I want, I can also check the free chlorine in the tap water by collecting a sample at the location of Red Star 2 before the tap water enters into the pretreatment cartridges. The last time I checked for chlorine at my location, I found that the free chlorine level at location 1 was undetected at less than 0.01 milligram per liter. That is very good for my RO membrane lifetime. If free chlorine was detected in that water, I'd want to look at replacing my carbon cartridge. Doing a little extra detective work and knowing that I'd be doing this webinar, I also checked the tap feed water at location two. I found that there was a little bit of free chlorine, 0.1 milligram per liter, which is a low value for tap water. That's good. If my tap water had high levels of free chlorine, like one milligram per liter, I'd want to make sure that I change the carbon filter often enough to prevent free chlorine from breaking through and getting to the RO membrane. As we've heard, scary things can happen if chlorine starts haunting the RO membrane. In the ops lab, this is the chlorine ghost hunting equipment that I use to measure free chlorine values. This tells me whether the ghost trap, aka carbon filter, is working properly or if it needs replacement. I use a Thermal Scientific Orion colorimeter or spectrophotometer, which comes preloaded with the free chlorine test method that I use. 
I also use an Orion free chlorine powder reagent and sample vials. To test for free chlorine, I add one packet of the free chlorine powder reagent to 10 mils of sample in a sample vial, and I mix well. If free chlorine is present, a pink color develops immediately, and I can read the value in milligrams per liter directly on my meter. It's easy. If there are other ghosts that can get into the RO system, what would they be? Well, if we have particulate ghosts, we want to bust those ghosts and make sure they get caught in our ecto-containment unit, otherwise known as the particle filter. As Kim discussed previously, particulates in the RO system can cause problems. For this ghost, we need another type of paranormal investigation equipment. To detect particulates, we want to measure turbidity. To protect the RO system, we want the turbidity reading to be less than one nephilometric turbidity unit, which is one then to you. If the value is higher than that, we may need to replace the particle filter or look at additional filtration steps. Turbidity can fluctuate throughout the day or the week or the month, but collecting this sample gives us a valuable snapshot. If I have already collected samples for chlorine testing, I can take a portion of the same collected samples and test for turbidity. I'll want to do this after I've already tested for chlorine so that I don't liberate chlorine and affect the chlorine results. If I'm not testing for chlorine, I want to rinse my container and collect the samples. Before testing, I'll mix the samples well, then test for turbidity. Shown here is the smart to pure system which is a tap to type 1 water system that uses RO as the first pretreatment step. Check the turbidity level before the RO after the prefilter at the Red Star 1 location. This result can be used to determine if the particle filter needs to be changed or if additional filters of different sizes are necessary. If the prefilter is plugging quickly, then check the feed water supply before the prefilter at Red Star 2 to see how effective it is at reducing the turbidity. In my location, the tap water typically has a low particle content, but the levels vary over time and can rise noticeably when the local water utility flushes the water mains. To protect the RO unit, we pretreat with a particle filter. And here's the ghost hunting equipment that I use for turbidity testing of feed water and tap water. This tells me whether the ecto-containment unit, otherwise known as the particle filter, is working properly or if it needs replacement. I use the Thermoscientific Orion Turbidity Meter, Standards, and Turbidity Sample Vials. After using some of my sample for testing for chlorine, if I wanted to do that, I can take a portion of the same collected sample and test the turbidity levels. I mix the sample, Fill a clean, dry sample vial, insert the clean, dried vial into the meter, and read the value directly in NTUs. It's simple. When you've got hardness ghosts in your machine, who are you going to call? You need the ghost-busting capabilities of a total hardness test. Remember that hard water can create deposits and surface scales in the RO system, which over time can damage the membrane surface. To protect the RO membrane, we want the feed water to be classified as soft. Otherwise, we will need some type of pretreatment for hard water to prevent scaling. Pretreatment would typically involve either water softening or hardness stabilization with an anti-scaling. Testing the tap water for total hardness helps determine how much and what sort of hardness pretreatment is required. If we're using a softening system rather than a hardness stabilizer, we want the treated water to have a hardness reading of less than 10 milligrams per liter after softening. If I've already collected samples for chlorine testing, I can take a portion of the same collected samples and test for hardness. Again, I want to do this after I've already tested for chlorine so I don't affect the chlorine results. If I'm not testing for chlorine, I want to rinse my container, collect the samples, and test for hardness. 
to bust those hardness ghosts before they get into the RO unit, hunt them down, collect a sample at Red Star 1 to determine the quality of the tap water, and if the chosen pretreatment is likely to be appropriate. If there's a water softener unit installed, determine if it's working properly. Collect a sample just prior to the RO system at Red Star 2. Value should be less than 10 parts per million as calcium carbonate. Last time I tested the tap water in my lab, it was reading around 95 milligrams per liter total hardness as calcium carbonate, which means our water is not soft but is considered moderately hard. Based on the reading, I know that hardness could be an issue. To protect the RO membrane and system, we pretreat our tap water using a hardness stabilizer. This is the equipment that I use in the Apps Lab to detect paranormal hardness activity. I use a thermal scientific Orion colorimeter or spectrophotometer, which comes preloaded with the total hardness test method that I use. I also use an Orion total hardness test reagent and sample vials. To test for total hardness in tap water, I add one tablet of the total hardness reagent to one mL of sample and nine mL of water in a 24 millimeter vial. Then I crush the tablet and mix well. If hardness is present, a pink color develops. After five minutes, I can read the value in milligrams per liter directly on my meter. Job completed. And here we are at the summary slide. We hope you've enjoyed today's webinar and you didn't find it too scary. We busted these ghosts for your lab water purification system. We reviewed three factors that shorten ultra-pure DI cartridge life. We identified the three contaminants that cause RO membranes to fail. And we introduced you to Ghostbusting 101, simple tests to identify the root cause of water system problems. And turning it over to Anne-Marie. Thanks, Gail. And thanks, Kim. It looks like we've received a lot of questions for our water experts. And of course, keep those coming in. Uh, but before we get to those, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to some links that are on the screen. The first is an attendee survey um, in the bottom left lower corner. If you get a moment to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. This is an opportunity to let us know how, what your opinions are of these webinars and to recommend future webinars. Um, there are also some resources there you might find of value that you want to, um, to download. So that's enough for me. Let's go ahead and dive into the questions. So the first question is, can I use calcium hardness results to determine the total hardness of my water? Kim or Gail? Hi, Amory. Uh, I can take that one. So calcium hardness is part of the hardness of total hardness, as you might guess. Calcium tends to be one of the main hardness cations, but magnesium is also um, very common. So if I have a calcium hardness number, I have an idea of my hardness, but I don't really know quite how hard my water is. So ideally, I'll have, I'll look for total hardness. But if I do have a calcium hardness number, a rule of thumb is that I could get an estimate of total hardness by taking that calcium hardness number and multiplying by one and a half. And that will give me an estimate, kind of a rough idea. So ideally, we'd want total hardness, but if we've got calcium hardness numbers, we do have a little bit of an idea, and we can make a rough estimate of total hardness. Fantastic. Thanks, Gail. Next question. Is there a simple test for TOC? And this is a two-part question. So I'm going to start over. Is this a simple test for TOC, and what is the level of TOC of concern? I can take that one. Um, so. There's not a simple test for TOC. Uh, generally, a TOC analyzer would be used to verify the levels of organics in the water. Um, the level of concern will depend on the system and the feed water. So you might need to double check with the manufacturer specifications for your particular equipment. Uh, so if it's a tap water or if the system requires a pretreated system or pretreated water supply, it might have lower levels required. Great. Thanks, Kim. Next question. Does it matter whether I test for free chlorine or total chlorine? Hi, this is Gail. I'll take that question. So 
Ideally, again, we want to test for free chlorine in this case. Free chlorine is the more active oxidizer and is the one that we expect will have more degradation effect on the RO membrane. So that's ideally what we want to test for. If we test for total chlorine, we might have a number that's estimated a bit high. But again, if you just have total chlorine numbers, that does give us an idea of what's in there and it could be better than not having any number at all. If you have the choice between the two, go for the free chlorine. Great, thank you, Gail. Next question. We're looking at a new water system because our old one is going through cartridges quickly. We do not have a conductivity meter to check the feed water. Is there another way to get this information to determine what is expected cartridge life? Um, this is Kim, I, I can take that one. Um, so actually, interesting question. question. Thermos fish are scientific in the United States and in Europe. We do have a free service called H2O Select. And this is really great if you're looking at a new water system. <clears throat> we will test the water conductivity, the TOC, and the turbidity. And we can determine what would be the best equipment to purchase. And we can estimate what the expected cartridge life would be. Now, if we do have an existing system that's having problems, we might be able to get a sample of the feed water and confirm the cartridge life you know, or to confirm if there's any levels of impurities, such as, the, again, the turbidity or TOC that could be causing problems as well. Um, the, the service is free. We have a test kit. Um, we supply the kit, the bottle, the questionnaire, and a shipping container. Um, and actually, you can download the flyer in the webinar fi resource files on the webinar. Thanks, Kim. And to clarify, that is the second document that you see under additional resources. And you can also visit thermoscientific.com forward slash select. Um, so we have time for one more question. Um, our lab has an RO system with carbon pretreatment. Sometimes the carbon plugs very quickly. What would be the cause and what can we do about it? Uh, this is Kim. I can take that. Um, so if you have carbon pretreatment, and if it is um, on a tap water supply, um, it, I'm wondering if your water supply is from an open body of water, like a reservoir. And, and sometimes you might find uh, seasonal changes with that water supply. Um, but you, or if it's not necessarily an open body of water, you might want to check with your city on any seasonal changes that could be occurring. Um, but you might need a, a, an a, larger carbon cartridge uh, to help remove those organics. Um, and in some cases, <clears throat> a multimedia filter might be suggested as well. So thank you, Kim. And a big thanks to Gail as well and all of our attendees for joining today's webinar. I know we had a couple of late arrivals, but um, don't worry. As a reminder, if you're a registered guest, you will receive an email within the next few days with a link to this recorded webinar. If you have any questions, um, feel free to email Kim or Gail directly. Their email addresses are up on the screen right now. I will leave the, the room open for another five minutes in case you need to copy those down. We do encourage you to visit thermofisher.com forward slash lab water source for future webinar details and to access our library of recorded on-demand sessions. So thank you everybody again and have a wonderful day.